One of the key ideas for under solutions is understand how substances dissolve, and especially how substances dissolve in water, since which are solutions and so in positive, that's the hydrogen, and one N negative, that would be the oxygen. So since water is polar, it attracts other water molecules. And instances like let's say we had a positive let's say it's sodium positive ion well water molecules are going to come around they're going to surround that and they're going to hold it in solution likewise if we had a negative ion let's say we had here a like chlorine well the positive part of water then is going to surround that and pull it apart from its solid form and hold it in solution. So this is the basic idea of how a solution forms. And again, the term is an aqueous, aqueous solution, we use AQ to represent that, for a solution where the solvent is water. So solvent is what it's getting dissolved in. If you picture salt, salt in this case would be the solute, and the water is the solvent. So let's look at how we can write balanced equations to show this dissociation occurs uh, when things dissolve in water. So dissociation is just this idea where something breaks into its ions, for instance, positive sodium and negative chlorine. So KCl, potassium chloride, the first thing we should show is that potassium chloride, before it dissolves, is a solid. But then it's going to dissolve in water. So it's dissolving in water to form ions. It's an ionic compound. We know that because potassium is on the left side of the stair step line. Chlorine is on the right side. So that means it's an, an ionic compound. <coughs> so it's going to make K and Cl. Now, potassium, well, we need to remember what charge it forms. The pattern is anything in group 1A forms charge. So it's K plus 1 plus and Cl. So everything in group 7A tends to negative 1 charge. So that's negative. And the state of matter should be shown as well. Since it's dissolving in water by definition, that means it's aqueous, AQ. It's an aqueous, that's one in which the solvent is water. The next one, iron nitrate, <coughs> iron 3 nitrate. So let me rewrite that here and uh, so we have a little more space to work with. So once again we should show that uh, before it dissolves it's a solid and it's going to dissolve in water. Now <clears throat> there's a lot of things we have to remember from earlier in the year. First, we need to remember that this thing right here, NO3, is a polyatomic ion. So that is NO3 negative 1 nitrate. And if we don't remember the charge, that's going to mess everything up, up too. We've got to remember the charge. So we have an ion there. And we have three of those ions, three negative nitrate ions. So the total charge then is negative one times three, or three minus charge. Now, iron, Fe, forms a cation, positive cation. But it's a transition metal, and so we need to figure out what charge it would have. <coughs> we figure that by knowing that the total amount of negative charge is negative 3. 
Therefore, the total amount of positive charge must be opposite to that, three positive. Now, there's only one iron, so therefore, the iron must have a three plus charge. So now that we know that iron has a three plus charge, we can write Fe three plus aqueous plus the nitrate. Now how many nitrates were there? There were three, right? So in order for this to be a balanced equation, that three, we need to put a three coefficient in front of the nitrate ions, and that's aqueous. The next topic is the topic of electrolytes. Electrolytes are substances that dissolve to produce ions. And those ions then are able to conduct electric current, kind of like this one right here, potassium chloride. If this one d dissolves completely, or it fully dissociates into potassium and chloride, it would be called a strong electrolyte. Whereas something that only dissolves partially is called a weak electrolyte and something that doesn't dissolve at all or stays as a molecule is a non-electrolyte. An electrolyte comes from the fact that they can conduct electricity since electricity shares the positive and negative charges here. Um, electrons can be passed through a solution with ions uh, from, the pos from the negative electrode to the <coughs> positive electrode. <coughs> so this first example now, we could use a table and look up what electrolytes are, but this example does give us some. First of all, there's a single arrow as opposed to a double-headed arrow. And so that indicates typically that the reaction goes to completion. It almost completely separates into its ions. Um, also, if we know uh, about solubility, we know that this is a very soluble compound. And so we could expect it to fully separate. So since we can use those clues to deduce that this separates completely, we would call this a strong electrolyte. The next one has a double-headed arrow, which indicates that it only partially uh, separates into ions or dissociates into ions. So it largely stays on the reactant side. If there's not very much, ion, very many ions produced, then it would be a weak electrolyte. It does not carry a strong electric current. So this is weak electrolyte. And the last one, notice that it doesn't change at all. So it remains as a molecule when it dissolves. Uh, was glu glucose or before, and it was still glucose afterwards, and so we have a non-electrolyte. And uh, so I guess we take the hyphen out, so non-electrolyte. 